Monday Night Rugby on Off The Ball with Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us, everyone in. Now, loads to talk about on Monday Night Rugby this evening. Great to have you with us. Uh, Munster beat Connacht at Thomond Park on Saturday. Leinster winners at home to the Scarlets on Friday. Ulster, uh, four bonus point wins from four against the Lions. Next weekend, Ulster play Connacht at the Aviva Stadium. Uh, Leinster away to Glasgow. Munster away to Ospreys. And November internationals starting to come very much into focus. Happy to say Jerry Thornley of the Irish Times is with us. Hi, Jerry. How you doing, Joe? And we have the former Leinster, Scotland and Ulster coach, of course, as well, Matt Williams. Hey, Matt. Hey, Joey. So, eventful uh, couple of days, I think, uh, Jerry. we can say. Munster 20, Connacht 18 at Thomond. An eventful few minutes there for Joey Carberry. Kick block down, Jack Carty pounces, game going the way of Connacht, and then uh, he rebounds to kick the winning conversion. Yeah, he showed nerves of steel, in fairness to that, put it completely behind him. Um, I have a tendency just to watch the kicker when I'm live at a game, Joe, because you know you actually don't have to watch the ball. You can just watch the kicker and you can tell from their body language whether they've hit it well or not. And he kind of ran through the ball very confidently to pick up the tee. He knew it was going straight between the posts. Whatever about Joey's running game, he might be lacking a bit of confidence. I think at the moment, a bit of a gap opened up at one point in the second half. He, in times past, I think he might have gone for quicker. Hopefully that's all he needs, just one clean break or score try and he'll get that old confidence back. But his goal kicking has been exceptional since he's come back and... Uh, yeah, he showed very good um, nerves there, good mental strength to overcome what had been must have been a pretty horrific moment for him. Um, regathering with his teammates underneath the post as Jack Carty is about to put the conversion over the bar to put Connett in front. Yeah, what about the game on the whole, Matt? It, it was a bit of a fizzer in my book, uh, Joe. I, I, I know Connett Munster games uh, can get very, uh, very turgid. You know, there's a lot of passion there, as always, a little brother, big brother type scenario, and you've got to give Connett a lot of credit. I thought they were a better team on the night. But it certainly wasn't a spectacle. Um, the Munster were very inaccurate and their their quality back line that, that they have just didn't see enough ball. I, th- I thought they could have put Connor under a lot more pressure if they had to move the ball a bit more. But to be fair to Connor, they, they kept Munster in a box. But I think the game was defined by the errors from the, from the officials awarding uh, a, a try that definitely wasn't a try. Uh, to Munster there in the dying moments of the first half, which which put a huge spin on the game in Munster's favour. That shouldn't have been should have been a penalty to um, to Connor for offside. Todd Byrne was well in front of Scannell when he kicked the ball, and um, uh, that he towed it through and went on to a try. How the officials missed it is beyond me because it just stood out as soon as you watched it. So he's offside, and then they didn't review it. I, I also thought that the, the sin binning um, Sammy Arnold Simeon was tough. Was, was tough. It was definitely high when you watch it on the replay. But it could have been a penalty. So w- w- let's not argue about the sin bin, but uh, the, the refereeing error on the offside was certainly um, the defining moment of the game for mine and and not a not a great spectacle of the game. A- and the best team didn't win. <laughs> so, other, other, much, than, other than that, though. <laughs> apart from that, apart from that and what I was really disappointed with is Munster have been playing really, really great rugby. Um, they Got to give them a lot of credit. They played fantastic rugby. And the week before, their young team with a few old heads in it played some spectacular rugby. And I was hoping for a bit more. And I think everyone was. And it certainly didn't live up to that expectation. Mm. Well, just to uh, sign off on the Chris Clude decision point for a moment, Andy Friend, Jerry was very frustrated afterwards. I, I suspect you were listening to him uh, talk about the situation. So he was uh, referencing the Tiernan O'Halloran flick which led to a try which was ultimately disallowed and, and correctly he acknowledged but he said of the burn offside by contrast he said it just doesn't get looked at it doesn't get poured over in the same manner as the O'Halloran flick they get seven points for it they win by two I'm frustrated and annoyed by that and then he was asked if he feels it's a a uh, general situation where Connacht get a bit of a raw deal with referees. He said, I'll let others decide. We very rarely end up on the right side. If it's a 50-50, it very rarely goes our side. It is hard. So that was Andy Franz's take after the game, Jerry. Yeah, very quickly, I would uh, I would tend to agree with Matt on, the, on the, some of Munster's back play. They hardly, I mean, Simon Zebo may have watched the game from beside me in the stands after an early pass from Mike Haley in a counter. They hardly worked him into the game at all. Even that, if you actually go back and look the build up to that high hit by uh, Sammy Arnold, which got the yellow card, it was the result, the product of some extraordinarily lateral back play by Munster, which was disappointing to see. Um, ironic that it ended up giving them a crucial one-man advantage for 10 minutes either side of the break, during which they got that controversial try. 
yeah, those quotes, I actually remember transcribing them because it was me who asked and we found the question afterwards if there was um, an institutionalised bias that were against Connacht and uh, he, that's when he said it was just inexcusable. And, and the, the most valid point is that they did, the two officials, the TMO, Brian McNeese and the referee, Chris Busby, did spend, did look at least three times and spend over a minute um, analysing the flick from Tiernan O'Halloran. They spent a minute and 40 seconds reviewing at least three times the double hit by Bundy Aki and Sammy Arnold. And for some reason, if they did review, Brian McAneese did review it, it wasn't apparent. They didn't appear to review it. And that was even more clearly using the 10 metre line as a gauge. Rory Scannell's kick is from um, the Munster side of the 10 metre line. Tyke Byrne is in front of the 10 metre line when Rory Scannell connects with the ball. And the point being that they just didn't spend as much time in that. I don't know. Maybe it's a difficult one for a young referee to disallow a try in front of 16,000 Munster fans after they've just cheered their team to the rafters. It's that bit more difficult. Maybe home advantage still comes into play. I don't know. But I remember interviewing Matt Williams a long time ago about this, ironically enough. And Matt said to me that there is an institutionalised racism against Connacht within Irish rugby in the RFU. And he might tone down those comments now and maybe use a word like institutionalised bias. I don't know. But they, you know, they've been bleating about perceived injustice from officials going back decades. Um, it's nothing particularly new here. Do you want to come in on that, Matt? Gee, thorny has got some memory, hasn't he? Bring it it's a hard quote to forget, Matt. Throw me under the bus like that, no, Jerry. You're right. And, and look, I do. I'm Andy friends and Alf. He's a, he's a mate of mine. And I, I employed him. He gave me his first job, so I was really feeling for him. But you, you, over the years, Connor never, ever get. Get the bounce of the ball. It's you just see it. You know, I, I think it's my 25th year watching watching uh, Irish provincial rugby, and you, they just never get it. it. There's no doubt about it. And and look, you've got that. There's definitely the home ground um, advantage. The referees around the world, not just not, not just last weekend. Home teams win for a reason. Home teams get the the percentage of of penalties for a reason because referees are human beings and they get influenced and you know I'm in France right now I can tell you you, you, you get a hometown refer, referees are everywhere over here they just don't give the away team the same advantage because they get influenced and I, I think whether it's it's I don't I don't believe it's a conscious thing but um, I, I think it's definitely a real issue. And you only had to look at that game the other night. I mean, that that was a shocking decision that didn't get refer, uh, didn't get uh, reviewed, and it was just so obvious to everyone that that uh, there was an offside player in front of the kicker. First thing you look at on a review is is the players that that uh, influenced the game after the kick behind the kicker, and it was just now it wasn't even looked at. Mm. But but look, it's, it's probably a bigger issue. I mean, I, 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 I spoke to Jerry. I remember having long conversations with Jerry about that officiating is the greatest problem in the game worldwide. In the championship in uh, Australia, that's just been completed, the international championship, three of the games were decided by officials, uh, technical rulings of officials in the dying moments of the game that gave penalties. And that shouldn't be the case. The players' skills should be deciding games. It's, it's a much broader issue than just the one we saw yeah. uh, the other night, uh, and it did, definitely did uh, rob Connett of a victory. But it is a much, much broader issue. Another really great rugby minor, I'm not going to say who it was, but the guy I was talking to, because he didn't, didn't know I was going to quote him on, on national radio, he said to me, if the referees, they're just untouchable at the moment. Within world rugby, they, are, they, they can't seem to get them to reform, to listen to a ways of change, you know, of, of trying to referees, of, of uh, allowing the TMO to override the referee in, in a much more easy manner than it is at the moment there's a they're, they're just untouchable and they're making error after error after error mm. especially at scrum time especially at scrum time we're seeing games being decided by scrum penalties the referees are getting those penalties wrong you know i i would say on the vast majority of the case 70 80 percent there's other factors in play and that's influencing the outcome of the game. So it's a, it's a it's a much broader problem in the game than just what we saw the other night. But it really brought it out. You know, the, the best team didn't win. And when we're saying that often, and referees are deciding referee decisions are deciding games, as we're seeing at the highest level of the game, the sport has a problem, and and we do. And and I, I just don't know what we can say. I've written about it. We've put it up. Everyone around the world is saying it, and we get nothing back from World Rugby. It's it's a huge issue. Well, rumours unconfirmed. Andy Friend is planning a Razzy Rasmus style video for during the week, so we'll look out for that. 
I, I would suspect he is massively frustrated friend, Jerry, because Connacht in so many ways, they're great to watch, high tempo games, Bundiaki back from that Lions tour and looked in great shape. Someone like Matt Hansen's a great find. And if you take it, say, from the Bulls win a couple of weeks ago, I would have thought friend was mapping out this route now to the November internationals and uh, certainly wasn't banking on 0 for 2. That Dragons defeat last week was a big blow and then to lose by two in the manner that they did at Thomond is deeply frustrating because they have to get off to a good start you feel this season they are under pressure to make the Champions Cup for a fifth year in a row given the current format and already this season is starting to feel like momentum is against them Completely. I mean, the difference in that result means I think they're something like 11 points adrift of the other three Irish teams in the table. So it all, they're already, you know, running up the hill backwards, as it were, trying to catch up with those, their three provincial rivals. The whole format of the competition has conspired much more heavily against them when you think they've got to play uh, their the top three teams in the table six times, and they're the only ones who have to do that. Um, and yeah, they need to take everything that comes their way. So they need to beat somebody like the Dragons at home. And they have been fitful and inconsistent this season already. Um, you think of that Bulls performance and then the way they came down. I thought that Dragons game, they should have been much further ahead at half time. Caelan Blade is held up over the line by Jonah Holmes. Then Jack Cardi missed a kick. They could have easily been about 22 8 up at half time, is sort of what they were. And then they just lost their way in the second half. And part of the performance against Munster was the response to that because they, their pride was hurt. They were a wounded animal. They knew they had to front up. And. Um, by all accounts, their, their training had been excellent. There were a lot of meetings between the players. It was very intense training. They came in very focused. But they're a good little side. They really are. They're like, mm. if you look at their launch plays, you look at that very first move of the match, and even their launch plays against the Dragons, they frequently get over the game line from all their launch plays off scrums or lineouts. There's a lot of variety. Nice. When do you see a hooker peeling around a lineout and feeding a little scrum half on the charge like Galen Blade on an out-in run to get over the game line? There's a lot of variety. That first minute move that put Mac, Mac Hansen through, and you're right, he really does look a find. But they've just got to be more consistent and they've got to command the basics a little bit better. Uh, if they take care of two restart receptions after their two tries in the second half, they win the match and yeah. they didn't take care of them. Uh, Matt, just to expand your point, uh, you were complimentary of Munster there thus far this season and they were criticised a touch, even though they won the game against the Stormers because it was so forward oriented and there's maybe an accusation of a lack of craft in there and that that's going to come back to bite them once again when they get to the latter stages of Europe and to be fair to them we are seeing players try things like I think a Dave Kilcoyne made a great break and gave the offload to John Ryan I'm not so sure we were seeing those types of things a, a while ago and you think you know Casey's lovely little reverse pass so we we are seeing uh, bits and bobs but you you were complimentary amongst you there you, you like the shape of them so far this year <clears throat> I, I do Joe and I I've sort of watched Munster the last few years especially really since Stephen Larkham has running their attack. And at times, they're, they're, they, their attack works and their skills let them down. I think it was against um, Rassing down at them in there a couple of years ago. It was a classic example. They had overlaps a number of times, but their individual skills uh, didn't take advantage of what the system that Stephen Larkham has put in place has created. So mm. they've got the system within them, but the individuals who haven't been working to the level required within the system. And I've seen an improvement in that uh, this year. I've certainly seen their skills step up, some great passing there in some of the early games. They're not the finished article, and they might win, an, win a, a trophy this year. They might still be a little bit uh, behind. But I, I can definitely see progress. And I also like what their attitude is at times. Now, they, they sort of, you know, the elements were, were, were pretty rough there at Thom and the other night. Like the, the, the night wasn't a night for running open, let's spin the ball rugby. But the, at times during the year, they have. And they've also got one other thing that I love, which is they've got some pressure in the squad now. They've got a lot of competition for places. They've got people stepping up and fighting the, the, the more uh, established players, like Craig Casey's done, uh, in, in a number of positions. And I think that is putting pressure within the group. And that that drives the, the performance of the team. You can see it at Leinster. There is that much pressure at Leinster for positions in that starting team that they are working their hearts out, and that drives performance. So I, I can see Munster moving forward. I don't think they are the finished article. They certainly weren't 
I have not been perfect, but I've seen glimpses of, of some real improvements this year. Yeah, where are you in that front, Jerry? Oh, wow. Munster are quite an enigma to me. I sometimes watch them think, yes, they're really developing something new. And then, you know, even when they win, they go back to the bludgeon, and, as it were, and go yeah. back to what their strengths are, the maul, the pick and jam, the pick and jam. And, and they're very effective at it, and their pack is quite powerful. They tried to bludgeon Connor, but Connor actually stood up them quite well on Saturday night. And there didn't look to be a plan B. The, 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 by way of variety, Jack O'Donoghue had the smarts to pop the ball to Dermot uh, Barron rather than plunge for the line himself. And I think that caught uh, Abraham Bapali off guard a little bit, and that's how the try evolved. But um, yeah, and you, you you look at a player like Simon Zebo and you see the impact he had in the first match, and you see his first run from that Mike Haley counter early on in the game, and then they hardly work him into the match. I wonder, you know, what they've got potentially the best attacking fullback in Irish rugby. And they're playing him on the left wing and they're hardly servicing him. I just wonder, could they be getting more out of him? I wonder, will he even make the squad on Wednesday, the Irish squad? Quite possibly not. And it just seems a little bit um, profitable, a bit wasteful. I'd like to see more of him in the game because he's such a weapon. He's an extraordinary try scorer. He's a line breaker. He's got a wicked kicking game, long and short. And there's just more they could be getting from him, for an example. But yeah, then you see them go to the Scarlets who are abysmal on the day and you see like a very young side score some cracking tries. You think of Ben Healy hitting the line and throwing out that long skip pass for Calvin Nash in the corner, and you think, and I, there's been so many good glimpses of the Larkham example, like even that race grassing draw was a thriller. Um, you think of that comeback win in Claremont, that strike move over line that ended up with a try, it was just brilliantly conceived, and there's no doubt, as Matt says, the skills are improving, mm. particularly the forwards linking with backs, that's been a big um, emphasis from Larkham, by all accounts, in training, and you, like that, you see Dave Kilcoyne make a, car- a, car- a bus like that, and Normally he would just, you know, tuck the arm under the, yeah. under the ball under the arm, just keep on going because that's what is in his DNA. And he throws a little, little, little pop offload to uh, John Ryan running yeah, the support yeah. line. I don't think you'd have seen that a couple of years. No, ago. you wouldn't for sure. So, because my, my my reservations, and I, I don't underestimate their potency, ball in hand, and their ability to bludgeon lots of teams. But just that back line, like I agree with Jerry when he says all the really eye-catching launch plays were from Connacht, you know, right from the off, that one off the line. And you don't really see that so much from Munster. And I also uh, share Jerry's uh, confusion at the lack of Simon Zebo's input into the game. And I mean, th- the configuration of that back line is interesting. So with the likes of Farrell to come back in and Diolande, we've seen Keith Earls twice now at centre. Is this going to, you know, is Earls ultimately going to go back out into the wing and Zebo goes to full back or... How's the, all this going to work and how are they going to get the most from this back line? Because there, there does seem to be enough talent there now to really play a bit more rugby. I, I think that you've certainly got to say that the two starting centres, favoured starting centres, Dillon Day and, uh, and Farrell are not there. So I think this is, this is certainly... Uh, Keith being put in at 13 is a, is a short-term uh, measure. Uh, obviously, Rory... Rory Scannell plays there, but I, I don't think he's going to make the starting team if everyone's fit. Yeah. I, I can't give you an answer on Zebo because I'm... I'm. Uh, let me give Mike Haley a, a rap. I think he has really improved his skills this year, but I would love to see Zebo at fullback. Now, that might be the case that Simon is not at the level of fitness required to wear the 15 jersey. I don't know. But there's no doubt that Irish players... Um, when they're in Ireland, are much fitter than Irish players when they go to France. And your fullback does more metres in a game than anyone except your nine. So they're usually your two highest, um, uh, fast-paced running metres are your 15 and your nine. And they might be building Simon back into the type of condition where he can cope with that those numbers as a 15. Personally, I'd love to see him there. And I'd have him in the Irish squad and I'd have him uh, in the bench for the November International because he covers so many positions and he's got an X-factor late in the game. He can bring him on and do it. But I do believe he's been wasted on the left wing. So I don't have an answer for you there, mm. but I do think one of the other ones is, is what Jerry was sort of slightly touching on is Joey Carberry getting his confidence back and and really being able to launch that, that team mm. going forward. Because like, if, you, if you just look at that, what the charge down from Carberry... Um, he should have passed that out to Zubo and Zubo should have banged it. That was what I thought was going to happen. He wasn't in the position to kick it. That's a lack of confidence, in, in my opinion. And he should have just hit Simon. Simon get the big left foot going, bang down that sideline. It would have been perfect. Instead, he, he, he rushed it, got charged down, almost cost them the game. Mm. So I, I'm not suggesting in any way that what I've seen for months is they're the finished article. They're really going to be banging on the door, lifting trophies. But I have, I, I'm definitely not. 
but I have seen improvements and I hope they keep improving and I hope they get some self-belief because there's there's much better performances in that side than, than we're seeing, uh, inconsistent performances than we're seeing at the moment. Fellas, would be uh, remiss of us not to, uh, on this slot, note the uh, genuinely extraordinary interviews. He's given several, Keith Earls has given and now around the release of his new autobiography. Matt, you may not have seen all of this, obviously, over in France, but he was on the Late Late, late Show. He's here yeah. in uh, Life magazine and the Sunday Independent. And if anyone's missed this, I suppose it's twofold, really. What he went through with his body is genuinely extraordinary. And at the time, he was playing some phenomenal rugby for Ireland. So there was a period where, effectively, he couldn't breathe. And this was during the Grand Slam winning year and beyond. And you think of his catch in Paris and... Uh, it turned out after trying all sorts and really just being confused and on the cusp of giving up that his liver had been dislodged and that was putting the pressure on his breathing. So eventually what solved it, they were over in London and found a consultant and they just strapped his torso very, very tightly to hold the liver in place and he ran out into the pitch and for the first time in a long time he was able to breathe, which you know you would think is a prerequisite for rugby. So uh, he was through the horrors with that particular injury but it seemed like all sorts of injuries, excruciating back pain. He said of the back pain and more, it ruined my life. I dreaded training. I came to hate rugby. I wanted to walk away from it to make the pain stop. It was back, it was neck, it was groin, it was hernia, a bit of everything, huge problems breathing. He says, I would put the physios under an awful lot of pressure. Stuff like getting acupuncture at half time of a game when I'm breathing out through my arse. There'd be needles in my neck trying to free up whatever pain was there. And he did ultimately go to... Johan van Graan and say he was done before they managed to find a solution and then uh, I suppose even more commendable his openness on his mental health situation and uh, really was battling some very serious issues so on the Late Late Show he talked about uh, Hank a persona he borrowed from that Jim Carrey film me, myself and Irene and uh, he says it's what they used to say to me at home is it Hank today or is it Keith he said with a smile although he emphasises his family always very very supportive of him so Uh, Hank to Earls' mind, it says here in Life magazine, is part of him that's prone to bouts of severe depression. And he talks about in 2013, he said on The Late Late Show, "Uh, Thankfully, I've never had suicidal thoughts, but Hank is always there and he's always negative and he's a fella I've lived with for most of my life. There are games I probably shouldn't have played in. I was in such a dark place mentally, but I found a way to get onto the pitch and take Hank down. Rang the doctor. This is in 2013. So you think, I mean, he's been in a Lions tour at this stage. I explained everything to him. He was brilliant. I went down to see a guy in Cork, a psychiatrist, and he diagnosed me with bipolar 2. He says there's bipolar 1 and there's bipolar 2. Bipolar 2, probably the better one of the two to get. I was delighted to get the diagnosis. I was genuinely losing my mind. And then one last uh, quote, and this is back in Life magazine. Uh, It got to the point I was complaining so much to Adele that she got annoyed, unbelievably annoyed, because I was just draining her. I wouldn't have been one bit surprised if she'd left me. Being the person she was, she helped me get through it. Uh, He says now that um, I'm still taking tablets to help balance out the chemicals in my brain. I've no doubt when I retire, I'll be able to come off them and I'll be able to manage better because I've dug deep. I found myself as well. I know when Keith is in my head and I know when Hank is in my head and I know how to get out of depression quicker. And then a final thought, and it's uh, this is a very sad quote, I thought, in some ways, but uh, again, he's so honest here. He said of uh, the book and coming forward about all this, I'm embarrassed to speak about it. I know I shouldn't be embarrassed, but I am. And my embarrassment is smaller than how it might help other people. So that, Jerry, I know I've rabbited on a bit there, but that's just some of what Keith Earl has been talking about this weekend, as well as playing a high-level professional match and hopefully adding very soon to his 93 Ireland caps. That is nothing short of extraordinary from a current sports person. Yeah, it's astonishing. It's extraordinary. It's very sad and it's also very... It's a story of triumph over adversity as well, isn't it? It's got it's got so much going on with it. It's an extraordinary story. It shows the battles he's had to go through. And, you know, it's, we sometimes we judge players, don't we, in all sports? And we don't know if they're carrying a physical injury, if they, what mental condition they're in, if there's any kind of ailment. And then, you know, I don't know if I did, but some, some of us probably criticised Keith Earls' performance during when all this was going on. It just it seems ridiculous now when you think about that. Um He's always been a really remarkably endearingly honest, lovely lad. I remember interviewing when he was only about 18 or 19 and I came away just blown away by how candid he was. He's a, he's had a great career that probably hasn't quite had the acknowledgement it deserves when you think that he's Ireland's joint second highest try scorer of all time after some bloke who works in your station occasionally. And uh, I hope he does get more caps and I hope he becomes 
the second highest tre- test trial score of all time for and it would be a nice fitting achievement for a great career but um yeah i'm looking forward to reading the rest of the book uh the whole of the book he's a i'd say it would be a good read because i'm rem- great it's a yeah, go on. I was just going to say, I remember the Lions tour of 09 when he had a bad start and dropped a couple of balls. Yeah. And, and yeah. I think it was commented upon at the time that mentally you could see that it got to him. And again, that was maybe just a glimpse of a certain fragility that may or may not have been there at the time and confidence was an issue. But I, I would say, Matt, even, you know, and, and we're all judging here from a distance, but he was diagnosed there in 2013 and he, he did say in the Late Late Show he's got a hold of things now in a great way. I would say the last... I don't know what, five, six, seven years in particular, Matt, Keith Earls' performances have been exceptional, even with the injuries. And I, I, th- I think he actually is a beloved figure in Irish rugby. Uh, I'd agree with that. I, I yeah, thought Keith's been playing some wonderful rugby the last few seasons. Um, you know, I, I, I think, Joe, someone in my life had mental health problems, had bipolar, it was a long time ago. One, no one spoke about it. Two, no one even knew what it was. And people, people's lives got ruined and suffered. And it, 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 it's just so brilliant that, that someone like Keith has the courage to come out and speak about the, the, these issues because it's, it's just so important that sports people who are under a lot of pressure uh, use, use their platform to tell the truth about these things, that it's it's not a problem. Go and get help, and and ask for help, and that's the big issue with with, with this issue, this problem, especially amongst amongst young men. Um, they don't ask. They don't put their hand up. They don't they don't come and say oh, I'm I'm feeling this way like Keith did. They deal with it, and they, the reality is that they don't deal with it until something mounts up, and they either you know that there's substance. People start self medicating, you know, alcohol or drugs or whatever, and they, they get themselves into deeper problems. And to hear Keith come out and speak about it, it was. and I, I watched the interview on, on the Late Late Show um, online, and it's exactly what Jerry said. I was so uplifted and so uncomfortable at the same time. But I've got to say, I sat there and said, mate, you're, you're one ballsy man. You're, no wonder you're a champion rugby player because... What you just done takes so much courage, and and I really hope if there's people out there that are listening that have these problems, a lot of people who were close to me had them and did nothing about it for far too long, and really affected their lives. Go and do something about it. It's not a problem. It's 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 a problem that can be. It is a problem. Sorry, it can be solved if you start and do what he said. I've got something wrong. I've got to fix. And um, you know, I, I was. Um, I was very moved by by what he said, you know, and and and, and Joe, well, I'm carrying on a bit now. Look, we, we had Noel Breslin, I coach Noel Breslin at Leinster, and well. Noel and I have had these long conversations about it. Noel was suffering from from um, mental health issues; he had depression and so on, and and we did nothing about it because we knew nothing about it as coaches. And Noel and I, have, I've done a podcast with him. I've spoken to him privately. I've apologised to him because I didn't know what to do about it as a coach. I didn't know what he had. And none of us did anything about it. We just thought, guys, you know, there was something wrong, they were lazy or whatever, they couldn't cope. And now that, thank heavens, that that we, when we can identify this, we know so much more about it, we can help people in, in sports clubs. But these guys that are leaders in our community, like Noel Breslin, has been so strong and, and so forthright in what he's done, and now Keith coming out and speaking about it, they are doing so much good for young people and, and for, for everyone, but especially for young people and young men. Where we're showing weakness you know, or showing vulnerability is regarded as weak, and it's not. It's yeah. just being a human being. It's it's wonderful. Yeah. Well, he's re- he's received an extraordinary reaction, Keith. I think he was. I genuinely think he was immensely popular anyway, and I think this has only um, brought you know more love and attention uh, to him. So. Uh, that's Munster. Clock is coming against us. Just to briefly round up some of the other action, uh, Leinster 50, Scarlet's 15. I mean, we're talking about Munster being forward-oriented, uh, Jerry. I mean, this was a fairly uh, forward-dominated game on Leinster's part, which, you know, so often they do just smash people up front and, and that's how they win games, to be honest. Uh, Johnny Sexton, hip injury of sorts with November coming into view. And uh, one other point to throw at you, and you can pick on any of these that I'm just kind of listing off to save time. Uh, they'll play their match next weekend. Leinster's next match under the new format will be the 27th of November against Ulster and I think Leo Cullen was talking might have been in your piece about you know players going off and playing AIL or Leinster A matches to try and keep fitness up because of course matches won't happen now during November so uh, that's broadly speaking where Leinster are at the moment 
Yeah, it's it's a. Re I wrote about this even before ball was kicked. Looking ahead of the season, this was going to be a problematic and tricky campaign for Leinster and all the uh, and all the other provinces, particularly Leinster though and Munster and Ulster, because in actual fact, not having matches during the November window is a disadvantage for their squads because they've got such great strength and depth. And this, if you like, takes away a little bit of that strength from them because they can't keep their players ticking over during November. Uh, look at look at Munster. As soon as the November series are over, they've got two matches against South African opposition in South Africa, come home and then have a week to turn around and play the back-to-back -back games in Europe. So it's uh, it's very problematic for the provinces. It's quite a balancing act when you look at Leinster's strength and depth, um, how they keep them busy. It's also a disadvantage for the Irish team going into the November test, Joe, because um, so many frontline Irish players are undercooked. A, because the Lions tour ended a month later, and B, because um, there's no Heineken Cup matches going into November. There always has been in the past, prior to the pandemic and the restructuring of the, of the season last year. So it's all conspiring a little bit against the Irish team. You think of Conor Murray, he might play his first game of the season next weekend. After the Lions tour four years ago, before the November series, he played five games for Munster, including derbies against Leinster and Connacht, either side of... Um, games against Castro and Racing in Europe. So it's a problem for Leinster. They were made, that was pretty much close to a full strength team, really, I think. Um, and although you say you're right in saying that, that it was a lot of it was down to the set piece and the, the power game of their mall and their scrum and their close range drives and getting them over the line, there was some very good rugby to get them into those positions. They've developed a good capacity to strike from their own 22 with Johnny Saxon doing the rap and bringing runners in. I could think of that Jack Conan break. There was, um, maybe there was a slight knock on that. That was a lovely... Um, off the cuff, heads up piece of rugby by Jemison Gibson Park, Roland Keller's power, then on to Caelan Doris for the try. But yes, you're right. Like, I mean, Andrew Porter, how do you stop Andrew Porter from one or two metres out? I was looking at the stats in this, Joe. The five Irish front row, the front row players, Ty Furlong, Keane Healy, Roland Keller, Andrew Porter, and Dan Sheehan, between them, they've scored 68 tries for Leinster. Mm. It's quite ridiculous. Mm. And now, I know you look at Dan Sheehan, particularly, who I think might make the Irish squad this week. Uh, and Porter and, and Roland Keller, their strike rates are ridiculous. Now, a lot of that with Keller and Gene is a compliment to the Leinster Mall, but they're just so, so clinical and ruthless. The Scarlets actually played much better than they did a week before against Munster. There was a, an emotional and physical reaction. They were bristling aggression from the start. They scored two fabulous tries. They weren't behind until the 30th minute, and ultimately they were blown away by the sheer power of the Leinster pack and the, Leinster, the accuracy of the Leinster game. If you even think of that Andrew Porter close-range finish, the, it's as much down to Gary Ringo's going out and doing such an effective clear out from Jemison Gibson Park snipe. It's just their breakdown work is on a different level from the other Irish provinces as well, I think. And it just shows that, yeah, the other thing as well, they're definitely trying to offload a lot more this season, I think. They're trying to play the ball out of the tackle. They're trying to develop their game further, develop other strike weapons. There were 20 offloads at the weekend. They've been close on 60 in their first four matches. And that's not kind of ones that didn't go to hand. They're just the ones, and they're, you know, just, there's been a few turnovers undoubtedly, but now's a good time this season to be doing this. Yeah, okay. That's the voice of Jerry Thornley of the Irish Times. Matt Williams with us as well. Rugby and off the ball is with thanks to Vodafone, official sponsor of the Irish rugby team, team of us, everyone in. Just a very final point, Matt. Ulster beat the Lions 26 points to 10. That's a fourth straight bonus point win for Ulster. I think a lot of people are looking forward to this Connacht game at the Aviva because Ulster haven't had to be exceptional thus far. It's been a gentle-ish start in the campaign but the uh, point to note is that I suppose parallels with Orgy Snyman after Munster's great win the other week uh, nobody in uh, Belfast felt very good about this bonus point win because Will Addison it seems now it's uh, been confirmed lower leg fracture uh, so in his four years Matt he's managed 26 appearances and it's such a pity because I would say in a lot of those 26 appearances and at times for Ireland, he's looked a real player. Like there's a hell of a player there in Addison and we're just not seeing it. And uh, look, I don't know how long a leg fracture takes to heal, but it's probably another season which is largely getting away from him. It's very sad news, isn't it? You just um, some, some players just seem to, to attract it. And, um, you know, as you say, that's an, a, an appalling statistic for, for Will that he's played such few games. Uh, having... Put, putting that aside, the, the other on a, on a plus, it's Sam Carter as captain. Uh, he missed most of last year with it, and uh, Sam coming back and playing uh, very good. Uh, former Wallaby and Brumby, uh, really doing a good job getting that team to be highly effective. They're not flashy and they're not brilliant, but gee, they're effective. You know, and and none more than Nick Nick Timoney there in the back row. He played 
six, seven, and eight. He played seven on a weekend, scored two tries, player of the match. And and young Nathan Doak again, you know, kicking the ball very well off the tee, putting in some really good performances. I'll be interested to see if he sneaks in as as someone they might bring into the national squad just to give him a bit of experience around the fringes. I'm not suggesting he should start or play or anything like that, but he he, he might be someone that would bring come through because he's certainly got the physique and the and the pedigree to do it. Lovely tall lad, six foot one, I believe he is, and and a really good position there. But but what Ulster are doing well, Joe, is they, they're just getting results. They're not doing anything flashy. You can't say, look, I fancy this team to win a competition, but they're at the top of the table and they've got the bonus points, and they they just keep doing it. And I, the, the next two games are going to be very interesting. They've yeah. got Connacht away and Leinster away. And and that we'll probably know a little bit more about uh, about where this team really is after those two. Yeah, Connacht game at the Aviva should be real occasion. So we'll, I mean, I suspect they'll have an angry Connacht coming their way. So we we'll look forward to that. Uh, fellas, super stuff tonight. Matt Williams, thank you. Jerry Thornley of the Irish Times, thank you. We'll leave it there. Cheers, guys. Cheers, Joe. Thanks, guys. Cheers, Matt. Thanks, Joe. See you, Joe. Monday Bye. night rugby on off the ball with Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us, everyone in.